Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me. Every single upload you know I love and I appreciate you so much. If you're new here, um, I don't always sound like this. I've been super sick, so maybe you like the sound of this voice. It's gonna change. <laughs> We've had some mic issues, or not issues. The new mic's great. Glad that we cleared that up for everybody in the <laughs> last episode about the whole mic thing. I know a lot of you guys were like, okay, I thought I was going crazy. The mic is different. So now I, I just feel like I need to address that. Again, you're not going crazy. Still the same mic, voice has changed. I've been super sick, but like mentally I'm feeling great. It's like, come on body, catch up. I, I've taken enough days off to sleep and try to recover and I'm feeling good. It's just like the cough and the mucusy sound is lingering. So I, I'm sorry. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll get this like voice and mic thing sorted one day. Anyways. All right, today's format is, it's gonna be like a little bit different than Anything that I've really done, I know some of you are just like, Sherilyn, stop. But I know that you like when I switch it up and I give you more content and we still do like the true crime video. So this week is actually more like it's a true crime video. We're not gonna like react to anything or read anything, but it's different in terms of it's just not one case today. I wanted to touch on cases that I cannot get out of my head, but they're like the mystery aspect to it is just so complex, so puzzling. They haven't been able to, to be solved. And really in these ones, there, there isn't really much of a path to go on. But I mean, who knows? Like it's, it's 2023, man. We could put something out there. It could just reach the right person at the right time and it, like give somebody closure and answers. Like, and I, I would love to have those answers. It's like, I, when I'm, t when I'm saying like, I, I've lost sleep, I'm like, what? Okay. What? What happened? We're gonna go be going over three cases today. These are three of the the top cases. I mean, they all are. We'll probably be doing this series lots because there's lots in my head. But these are some of the cases that keep me up at night. All right, the first one we're gonna talk about is the, I guess, disappearance and then discovery of Judy Smith. This one has, has had me in circles. So in 1997, Judy was a 50-year-old nurse and recently married to her second husband, a lawyer named Jeff. This was like the, you know, second chance at love for Judy and Jeff type situation. Judy is described as a very caring, um, fun-loving, compassionate, and a responsible person. She was a home care nurse, and that's actually how she met her husband, Jeff, because she was taking care of his father after his father had like uh, throat surgery in the 80s. So at this like next phase in Jeff's life, he had remembered Judy and always remembered that kindness that she showed uh, to his dad. He recalled like this one time, she just had to like Jimmy rig this like contraption to hold his IV bag properly until like proper reinforcement came because like the IV bag rod wasn't there. Anyway, just one thing that he like thought like, oh, well, that was like cute that she did that. And then it just turns out that Judy was also, had also gone through a divorce. Jeff had a grown daughter and Judy had two children that were grown as well. So when they got together, you know, Sparks flew. It was all about them at this point. The kids were up and grown and they got married in September, 1996. Like I said, Jeff was a lawyer and he, his law practice focused on healthcare and he represented a pharmaceutical company or rather it was like um, an organization of like researchers and executives. So eight months into their marriage, Jeff has this conference that he has to go to in Pennsylvania and he and Judy decide, okay, well, let's kind of turn this into a little bit of a business trip at first and then we will go off to New Jersey and go and visit some friends and turn it into like a, a honeymoon of sorts. So on April 9th, 1997, Judy and Jeff go to Logan Airport and as they're approaching the check-in, Judy realizes she forgot her ID. She needed identification to fly. So Judy says, oh my gosh, Jeff, you know, don't let me forgetting this affect your schedule, your trip at all. You go ahead and I will go on standby or get a later flight in the, like this evening and I'm gonna go get my ID. 
So Jeff goes ahead. Sure enough, Judy was able to get on a later flight that evening and met up with Jeff at the Doubletree Hotel in Center City, Philadelphia. And this is where the conference was also being held. I guess she felt really silly about the whole thing. She even like showed up with flowers for Jeff. I was saying this, oh, it was on my live on Patreon yesterday. My daughter ended up taking over the whole Patreon. It was really adorable. Her and a fellow Sippendale's son were like meeting on Roblox. Anyways, going off topic here, it was really cute, but they were playing in Roblox and then he gave her flowers and then she wanted to give him, give him flowers. And I was like, oh, that is so adorable. You know, like uh, let's normalize giving the, the men some flowers. All right, so Judy gets there that evening. They have their dinner, go back up to the room. The plan is the next day, obviously Jeff's there for a conference. He's there for two days for conferences. So Judy is going to take the opportunity to go in and do some sightseeing. Two of the main things that she wanted to see was Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. So the plan was for her to go do that. And then she told Jeff she would come back to the hotel for 5 p.m. because there was like this nice cocktail party at six that she was able to attend with Jeff. Morning of April 10th, side note, remember how we always talk about like weird days? April 10th is my mom's birthday. Let me know if you're her birthday twin in the comments. So it's morning of April 10th, 1997. Judy leaves the hotel. She's got her signature red backpack on. Everybody said that when Judy traveled, you'd most likely see her like in pictures with this red backpack on. When the conference of, you know, the, the daily activities wrap up, Jeff said that he got back to the hotel room around 5.30. So it's like about a half an hour later than what him and Judy had planned on, uh, you know, meeting each other for. So he's definitely thinking, you know, oh, sh she's probably up there waiting. Gets up there, she's not there. But he starts getting ready for the party, thinking of a number of things, you know, like okay, she's waiting for a taxi, she'll be here soon. She knows the cocktail party is at six. So when it gets closer to six, he thinks, okay, still no Judy. Maybe she's downstairs already. And like she did get here earlier or at five, got ready in record time. And she's downstairs waiting for me. So he goes down to the cocktail party, looks around, doesn't see Jody, goes back up to the room, you know, seeing if they're just missing each other on the elevator. As one comes on, the other comes off, no sign of Judy. By 6.30, he's really worried. This is really not like Judy at all. She's very punctual and she's very responsible. And even forgetting her ID was very unlike Judy because she just was always so, you know, organized and, and on it. It concerned him enough that he called the police right away. He called around to hospitals and he ordered a cab to drive him around the city, specifically these landmarks that Judy wanted to go and visit to see if he could see her there. Oh, okay, this eyelash is off. Okay, well, that was an ordeal. Now I have to acknowledge your vision. You're not seeing things different. I lost the eyelashes, okay? One of them was no longer sticking. I couldn't find eyelash glue. I, I'm going through it, okay? I don't know if some of like the Neo Citrin and NyQuil is overflowing. Maybe iced coffee will help. Lost the eyelashes. We're just mascarying it. Let's move on. So Jeff goes out looking for Judy. No sign of her. Police get involved in the investigation and they basically tell Jeff, you know, there's not too much you can do. You're not from here. We are going to, you know, use all of our resources, go out. And Jeff makes a really hard decision that when, you know, the trip is over to go back home. He flies back to Boston, but something that he's like, you know, knows that he can do is spread the word, get some attention. So when he gets home, he ends up mailing and faxing out 9,000 missing person flyers with Judy's picture on it all along the Eastern seaboard. And then he also hires like the top three private investigators that he could find to, you know, be an extension of him, but accomplish some things. Initially to the family, Judy's daughter, particularly and Jeff was that maybe when she was out and about she got into an accident of somehow maybe she fell hit her head and had you know short term amnesia or something like that they're just kind of hoping for something to come you know across the table for them being like hey this you know kind of like an uh, overboard moment like Gold Goldie Hawn like do you guys know this woman it never came and despite there being three private investigators a search that was going on 
within, you know, the Pennsylvania department, no sign of Judy, like just not a, not a single trace. Five months later, September 7th, 1997, 700 miles away from Pennsylvania in Asheville, North Carolina, a father and son who are out hiking together come across what they believe to be human bones. There was clothing left at the scene, but there was no identification, no wallet. The only thing that they could really tell based on, you know, what was left from the clothes was that there were these cuts and punctures in the clothes that were consistent with what the medical examiner said they believed to be stab wounds. Initially, she's a Jane Doe when she's found, but because of those nine thousand flyers and faxes that Jeff sent out, Judy was on investigators' radar so quickly they asked for her dental records and matched them across the remains that were found. And unfortunately, fortunately, I also, for the family to have closure, but unfortunately, because she was no longer alive, Judy was found. However, there's still a massive question that needs to be answered for, you know, closure. I know it's impossible. It, it's such a hard term because it's impossible to get full closure. But the biggest question is why? How did she end up there 700 miles away when she was found? Another thing, sorry, that I forgot to mention was she was found and there was money at the scene. It totaled like $167. She was also wearing her diamond wedding ring. So people are like, well, it's not robbery. And usually, you know, if it's just like a random robbery attack, you're not like off the beaten path just hiking. To go even further into it, as they start investigating more, it becomes more puzzling. They come across four separate witnesses who had seen and had interactions with Judy in Asheville. And this was days after she initially disappeared from Pennsylvania. All of them said that Judy seemed very happy, friendly, she wasn't in distress. She even was speaking with a store clerk at a really cute local boutique about being from Boston, her husband was a lawyer. They had just been in Pennsylvania and she decided to make her way south. Super puzzling to those who knew her because she had never made, you know, this desire to go and visit Asheville known to anybody that she knew. But when she was found, the clothes that she was found in were not what she was last seen wearing in Philadelphia. And they were actually more appropriate for hiking, you know, which was appropriate for the condition that she was found on a hiking trail. I mean, so many theories go out there. Somebody that was friends with Judy at one point had come forward and said she was aware of some struggles that Jeff and Judy were having. And I mean, given the fact that it was a, you know, a newer relationship, new marriage, a lot of people say the, the hardest year of marriage is often the first year. So I don't think that's overly alarming. Obviously something to look into. And Jeff was very open about that too. He said, you know, obviously there was no, it wasn't rainbows and butterflies every single day. But he said that he deeply loved Judy and never doubted that she didn't love him back. Even her daughter said that Judy loved Jeff and just her character being that like loving, nurturing, caring person, always thinking about other people. She said that it, it would be so out of character for her mom to just up and leave and know that her absence and worry was going to hurt Jeff. Investigators did, you know, look at Jeff, the husband. That's Investigation 101, I guess. Jeff was at the conference all day, so there wouldn't have been time for him to take Judy all of this way. No one believed that he had hired somebody to also carry anything out. And when they looked further into the items that were found at the scene, there was also a backpack found, but this wasn't Judy's signature red backpack. It was a blue backpack that none of her family or friends recognized. And inside there was a pair of designer glasses that again, nobody that knew Judy recognizes being hers. So investigators believe that this backpack is possibly linked to the killer. The only really strong speculation or theory that I've seen online is that it was considered that she was possibly a victim of a serial killer from the area named Gary Michael Hilton. He also left a victim in similar condition, stabbed, and it was near where Judy was 
discovered. However, the only statement that detectives have really put out in terms of that lead is that when he was arrested and questioned about Judy's case, they said that there was no indication that he was tied to her disappearance and murder. Unfortunately, Jeff passed away in 2005. However, the reward money that he had put in to solving his wife's case and the state's reward money combined is seven $15,000 is still out there for finally solving this. And I mean, it just, the more you think about it, the more you spin. I've been bamboozled by the whole case. It makes no sense, especially knowing about people speaking to Judy and her just being so sweet and chill and nonchalant, being like, oh yeah, from Boston, husband's a lawyer. We were just at a conference decided to make my way down here, but then she was never in contact with her family, which was so important to her. She was always thinking about other people. You know, how did she get there? Why did she go there? Was she actually hiking at that time? Was she lured to go hiking? Did somebody find her? I, the questions are endless and this is where we are. This is why I can't sleep, you guys. I'm really curious to see what you guys think. I think that that is, it, it can be a very positive thing. Obviously, you know, I like to keep an eye on the comment section as much as I can. My best friend is always <laughs> lurking in there too so that we can keep things respectful. But there also is something that can productively be done by putting ideas out there that maybe we don't consider. Especially me for this one. This has been a case that I've thought about so, so long. I've wanted to talk about it, bring attention to it, but I just didn't know how because it wasn't enough for me to, you know, compile a full episode on. But those cases that, you know, we can't get full exposure on in like a 50 minute video still require some help and a little bit of push. I mean, this is from 1997. So I don't know, seeing new theories and not just being stuck on the ones that I've been in my head with like for the past two years <laughs> is always refreshing and kind of helpful and, and makes you maybe look into a different direction or consider something that you hadn't. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on all of these cases. We have two more. This next one, I only recently was informed about it, but again, has not left my thoughts. I believe it was Melissa. It, it was. It was Melissa in the Sippendale group on Facebook that posted this the other day. This mystery had a backstory that I had no idea about. And I'm really curious to know if anybody knew this about this song. So you know me too. I love the 90s, big 90s guy out here. And you probably would instantly recognize a song called The Way by Fastball. First, I was like, The Way, Fastball, not coming to me. Second, I heard the intro note of the song. I was like, what? This song, is kind of loosely based off of what the singer's interpretation of what, you know, the couple was going through in their final days, moments, was. And then it's very, very emotional and sad to think back when you listen to the song again. I'm not, I, I can't play it because it's gonna, you know, get copy striked, but I'm really gonna do a number here by serenading you with this sexy voice. So it's the one where it starts off and it's like, they made up their minds and they started packing. Do you guys know? They left before the sun came up that day. You know? But where were they going without ever knowing the way? Anyone can see the road that they walk is just paved in gold. Okay, you guys get it. So this is a really, you know, sad, heartbreaking backstory behind how that song became a song. This is actually another case from 1997. And the case involves a couple, an elderly couple, 83-year-old Layla and 88-year-old Raymond Howard. Precious. The Howards lived in... I, I hope I uh, say this okay. I, you, I mean, you guys know, I probably won't, I'm sorry. S Salado, Salado, Texas, Salado. Let me know if it's number one or number two. Salado, Salado. Salado number one, Salado number two. Maybe it's not even <laughs> any of them. And in that case, say three, Sherilyn, and just stop trying. Every single year, Layla and Raymond would attend this music festival in a nearby town called Temple. 
I guess it wasn't very far away, like maybe 15 miles from their home. And it was something that they looked forward to doing together every year, especially driving out there together. But this year, however, their son was concerned. Not long before the trip, Raymond had suffered a stroke and Layla was starting to show signs of early Alzheimer's disease. He didn't not want them to go to the festival. He knew how important it was to them and probably that it was going to, you know, bring bring some excitement and happiness in their life, which they definitely needed at the time. But he was like, just let me drive you. I won't cramp on your style. I'll leave. I'll come pick you up. But they were like, no, part of the fun was that we do this every single year and we drive out together. So they insisted they were fine. You can imagine their son was probably anxiously waiting the phone call that they had returned and he could have a sigh of relief. And sadly, it never came. They never returned after the festival. And as the days went on and they're trying to be positive, but there's still no sign of them, they contact the police. And this is kind of, you know, kind of ties into Judy. When the police start investigating, they find out that some people have seen Layla and Raymond. They actually found an employee at the Walmart in Temple, which is where they were heading to, that remembers seeing them the morning that they would have left having a coffee. The next person to come forward saying that he recalled seeing both of them was actually a sheriff in Arkansas. And he said he pulled them over on July 2nd for having their headlights off in the evening driving on the highway. I guess where they were pulled over, this was like 500 miles away and it was nowhere close to where their home in Salido, Salido, Salido or Temple was. Just within the, you know, the small chit chat of where you headed, the sheriff said that they did tell him that they were trying to get to Texas and he just quickly gave them some directions, told them to turn their headlights on, had no idea that this couple had been reported missing by their son and let them go with just a warning. I can only imagine what that sheriff probably felt afterwards after he found out because by this point, their picture had been out there, their license plate had been out there. There was a significant area that people were aware that they were missing, but this sheriff, unfortunately, he, he didn't know. So he let them go. And the next time that they were seen, the next day, it was in a farmer's market in Arkansas. And by this point, there were a lot of people in Texas that were looking for Layla and Raymond. So part of that, you know, mystery is, did they know that they were being looked for? They, they were out in public areas, letting people know, like the sheriff know where they were headed or where they were trying to go to. And despite a lot of people being aware of the case, it's just like those people that they interacted with or saw and places that they went just happened to be places that weren't quite up to speed yet. Then back at the house adds to more of the questions that you guys, you're gonna be going through this like I have. Back at the house, the son found it odd that the calendar that they always used and went by, it was open to February, even though it was June. And I mean, that also, that could have just been part of like the earlier signs of dementia that Layla was starting to show. Maybe she just wasn't on top of the calendar like she once used to be. But their hearing aids were also left behind. You know, they're going to this musical festival. It's really important to them. You'd figure you want to amplify that sound. They left them. And they also had both of their clothes neatly folded and organized on the bed, ready to pack for the trip, but they weren't actually packed to go on the trip. Their cat was also uh, left without any food or water and all of their appliances were unplugged. Finding this, this just like amplified the urgency to try and find them, especially because the thoughts are going, okay, well, maybe we thought that this was a stroke that he was recovering from, but he's also forgetful. And then the early signs of Alzheimer's is becoming much, much more aggressive. By this point, there were just so many volunteers out looking everywhere. They were hiking, looking through all, you know, the, the, the convenience stores, the Walmarts, everywhere that you could think to look. Pretty much everybody was on board with trying to find these two. And then sadly, two weeks after they went missing, hikers that were just outside of Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
found the missing Oldsmobile that belonged to Layla and Raymond. And it was at the bottom of this 25 foot cliff. I guess this area had already been well searched by police. So the belief is that it ended up here after the search, which was still within the area of all of these people looking for them. And inside the car, they found the body of Raymond and then 25 feet away, Layla was found. The condition that the car was in and the you know forensic investigation behind all of that is what it adds to this mystery of those final days and moments. They were able to determine that the car went off the side of the cliff going about 50 miles per hour and there was no sign of skate marks or anything like that leading to that like the, the final moment there. So it's like there was not even an attempt to swerve or slam the brakes on. So then that started the, you know, conversation and theory of was this intentional? And this is where, I mean, you can, you can theorize all day. And I think that's exactly how the song came to be. So like I said, during this investigation of them just looking for Layla and Raymond, this was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. And the lead singer of Fastball, Tony Scalzo, I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. He's a Texas-based musician. So he's seeing and hearing about this everywhere. And it consumed him, kept him up at night, and he did what he knows best is just putting that emotion, the, the thoughts onto paper and turned it into a song. I guess the song was released a year after Layla and Raymond were found. And he, he did it because it was something he couldn't get off his mind. And a way that he thought that he could kind of immortalize uh, the story and kind of have like a memorial for this, this couple so they were never forgotten. And his take on it. It just goes to show how music can be so touching and beautifully sad. He has openly said, you know, this is a romanticized version of what most likely had happened and that the Howards were in charge of their own fate and destiny and decided to kind of have that Thelma and Louise moment to not let the health issues that they were battling and this looming devastation of Alzheimer's hurt them, their family, and and chose their fate. I guess the case has never been, you know, officially solved. There's no answers. There was no note or anything like that left behind. So like I said, you're just kind of left to theorize and you can either go the route of this was an unfortunate random accident because their health was declining or that they went, you know, to go on this festival drive and it felt really nice to be out and just the two of them driving and had this serenity and left it all behind on their own terms. I'm telling you, when you listen to the song and read the lyrics back now, honestly, like pause and do it. It's so emotional. And then it it just breaks your heart because you're just like, oh my God, Layla, Raymond. I'll never listen to it the same again. I don't even know what my thoughts were. I, 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 I'm, I'm, to be very honest, I never really had like a, a connection. I just, I loved the, the catchiness of the song, but I will say that there was always this like something about the, the chorus when it hit, like that was very empowering. And I think that is really, really profound because I didn't even know the story. And now that I do know like the meaning and the intention behind it, I mean, it just like catapults it. I wish, I wish we could get that song trending again and have people know the meaning behind because even the band has said that a lot of people aren't aware, you know, who was behind it and inspired and created this song that is, I think, timeless. If you're a TikToker out there and you're good with like, you know, making the algorithm work in your favor, I challenge you to use a song, use this as a song and get it going again. If we could do it with Stranger Things, come on, Sippendales can do it again. And then we'll just make sure that everybody knows who wasn't aware prior, who it's who it's about. All right, our last one, again, I apologize because I know that I'm going to be the reason for you sleuthing tonight. You're not gonna be able to see, you're gonna wanna go into like every forum, every theory, all of it, and I apologize. But also like not really because I need you to be in here with me. All right, so our last mystery is the one of Brian Schaefer. Unlike the last two, this did not happen in 1997. This actually happened in 2006. And Brian Schaefer was a second year med 
student last seen out with friends at a bar in Ohio and there's no other way to put it, basically vanished out of thin air because even surveillance never captured him leaving this bar. Like I said, college med student, he's out with his friends celebrating spring break, March 31st, 2006, two of his friends and him decide to go to this bar. I guess it was like a, a well-known college bar. The name, the name makes me giggle every time given the you know, frustrating, sad story behind it or behind Brian last being there. Anyways, it's called the Ugly Tuna Saluna. Brilliant name. Now, I guess Brian and his one friend Clint had initially started out at the Ugly Tuna Saluna. They did a couple shots and then they briefly left. And this bar and surrounding bars and the area all had surveillance, their CCTV. They were captured. All of their moves movements were. And so you see that Brian and Clint end up meeting up with uh, another mutual friend of theirs named Meredith. When they meet up with Meredith, they head back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna. And then now by this point, it's like 1, 1 15 in the morning and it's April 1st now. They're doing their thing, but I mean, if you've been out with some friends sometimes, it happens in the evening where sometimes you just kind of like lose the pack and you're out on your own. It's really scary when it happens. It's only happened to me once and then after that, I like clung on to my friends for dear life. Although that time that it happened, I ended up meeting a dear friend of mine who to this day is still somebody that I cherish and love so much. And, and he was a stranger and took care of me until I was able to find everybody anyways. So this was one of those situations, but it was Clint and Meredith that had lost Brian. They kind of kept doing their own thing, but like also searching for Brian while they were doing it. And they even waited until after last call for the bar to kind of like fizzle out and get a better look around to see if they could find Brian, but they couldn't. So by the end of the night, as everybody's leaving, they just assumed, okay, well maybe since he got separated, he's trying to find us, thought we left, and he just kind of went off and, and went home by himself. So they leave, but it's not until about 48 hours later that Brian's family actually find out that he's missing because his friends, again, didn't really think much of it. They thought, okay, the next day, if he's not gonna answer, it's because he's not feeling too well. But they assumed he made it home. But two days later, he was scheduled to go on a trip with his long-term girlfriend. And of course, when she couldn't get a hold of him for the full day leading up to it, she thought, same thing, maybe he just wasn't feeling that well. Regardless, he knows the, the itinerary. We've gotta be at the airport this time, we're going on our vacation. And when he didn't show up at the airport, she knew that something was wrong. And that is when an investigation was officially started and, and police were informed that he was nowhere to be found. The first thing that the investigators do is they, they go to the Ugly Tuna Saluna and they review the security footage. And I guess the way that their security footage was set up was there were different camera angles and, and different features. So there was a manual camera and like the one that just like stayed on the entrance slash exit. And then there was one that panned the area as well. Basically making it impossible to like you know, slip through and go undetected. There's also the CCTV footage that is going around in the area too. And from that, you can see at 1.15 when Brian, Clint and Meredith arrived at the bar. And then the next time that Brian is shown on camera, it's about 1.50. He's not with Meredith or Clint, but he's outside, excuse me, and he's having a smoke with two other gals. And you can see on the camera that when he's done, he goes back into the bar. But from that moment on, he's never, he's never seen again. Just giving us a physical description of Brian, he wasn't somebody who could like easily just slip away and go unnoticed. He was 6'2", 165 pounds. And I guess he had a very uh, noticeable Pearl Jam tattoo on his right arm. And you can see it in, in video footage. Sorry, it's left. I, I said right, but I was like, like left. I, I knew those anyways. Now there was like a private exit that you could leave the Ugly Tuna Saluna from. But given the description, it, it wasn't something that 
you would easily come across. I think this was more for like staff and stuff. And then outside of it, there was a really heavy construction zone going on. So it wouldn't be like something where you would open up and be like, oh, okay, I can try to navigate through this. It just didn't make sense. And I guess that the investigators did look at this as a, uh, as a possible situation, but ruled it out. And then the only other way that they could have made sense about him leaving the bar was there was a balcony. And so he would have to like scale and then jump off this balcony again, undetected, and then saunter off into the abyss. Like he didn't even go home. Like it's, it, there's so many scenarios. You've got the the one of like, okay, well, if he, he left, he's not just living in the ugly tuna saluna. How did he leave? When did he leave? How did he go undetected? There has been thoughts that maybe he changed all of his clothing, but the investigators have been pretty adamant that they have scoured the footage, looking at everybody's faces, not just like identifying him from the last thing that he was seen wearing, and they cannot see Brian on the security footage or any surrounding footage whatsoever. Even like the, the surrounding bars, I do just wanna, it's not pertinent to the case at all, but the some of the surrounding bars names, they've got great names out here. Lucky's Stout House and the Sloppy Donkey. So neither of those picked up Ryan. And then even the security site, even if you were gonna say, okay, well maybe he was able to navigate it. It also had 24 hour security because it's, they, they often do this at security site, um, at construction sites, making sure that nobody's messing with any of the equipment there, but also like as a safety precaution because somebody could be in the situation, they could fall and then you, you just go and you start plowing and you start digging and, and you don't know that somebody's there. So he wasn't seen on the, in the construction site either. Now, some of the theories, if you believe that Brian was able to just escape and, and slip through all of these cameras and go undetected, and that this was like very well thought out, even though he was highly intoxicated as per his friend's account who last saw him, what the motivation be was from just like walking away from his life. Like I said, he had a long-term girlfriend, they had this trip to Miami planned and this trip was actually a gift from his mom who had just passed away weeks prior. And this was like a gift that she left for him to go and, and enjoy Miami and enjoy his time with his girlfriend. And those who were really close with him said that he actually planned on proposing to her on this trip. So he had like plans for the future. But then there's the other people who speculate that it was too much for him that he lost his mom. And maybe he was just wanting to like walk away from his life due to the grief. It's really hard to, I don't know, get on board with that concept for me personally. Like I said, he had all of these plans. He was going on a trip. He was going to propose to his girlfriend. So he had the ring. He was also set to go watch his favorite band, Pearl Jam. And it's not like he was just like a fan of Pearl Jam. Oh, I'm going to the Pearl Jam concert. I mean, this guy had a tattoo of, you know, Pearl Jam on his left bicep. He was committed. He was a fan. And I guess his girlfriend actually auctioned off the tickets from, you know, for the concert and put it towards uh, a reward in his investigation. And it even has caught the attention of Pearl Jam. That concert that Brian was supposed to go to, Eddie Vedder actually made a plea to the audience that if anybody had any information whatsoever to contact the police. And even years later, like in 2010, they did another tribute song to keep, keep his name out there. This is still unsolved. Brian has not been found. The only, I guess, suspects that have come under fire have been Meredith and Clint. They were the two that gave, you know, the accounts of Brian of that evening. They were with him. They were the last to spend time with him. Meredith was very cooperative, I guess. She willingly went down, gave a statement. She took a lie detector test and passed. And I mean, I know that lie detector tests aren't, you know, usable in court or anything like that and don't hold a lot of weight, but she was willing to do it. And then I guess Clint immediately hired a lawyer. This led to a lot of speculation. I think it still leads to a lot of speculation, but I also want to try to be unbiased in this because we don't know Clint's family situation. We don't know his connections to, you know, law enforcement. He could have a lawyer in the family. He could have a police officer in the family. And usually if you do or you have someone close, that is always a recommendation. It's like, just don't talk because maybe you do take a polygraph and you're completely innocent and it shows that you're deceptive or inconclusive and those can be red flags. But unfortunately, 
also not cooperating is also a red flag. And so it's like there's not really a win-win situation here when it comes to Clint. And I think that's left quite a lot of speculation. But it's also worth noting that Clint and Meredith were seen leaving without Brian. And this is still where we are, like literally no progress since 2006. So I wanted to bring attention to it. And also in 2021, the Ohio Attorney General's office, they released like an age, an age progression photo of what they believe that Brian could look like today if he is alive and out there. And so I wanted to also share that update too, because I mean, hey, 2006 was a long time ago. So if we can bring any attention to possibly what Brian could look like today, if he is still out there and has a story to tell, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people want to hear it and are hoping for that kind of outcome. All right, you guys, I I don't know about you. I'm spinning. I'm very anxious to hear what your guys' thoughts are in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. If you have not already, please, if you if you could kindly, I'd love to start off this year going into, you know, January, mid-January, heading into fe February, already at 200,000 supporters. You guys mean so much to me. So I, I know there are a lot that watch that don't subscribe and that's cool. I know it's hard to get a subscription, but if, you know, I could earn your, your business, that'd be great. Your commitment, your friendship, become a sip and jail. Also, I've heard sometimes, often actually, not sometimes, a lot. YouTube will just unsubscribe people and it's rude. So maybe just do a double check. Anyways, I got goals. We've got some lies that we need to change out there. And I and I, I, I do that with, with views. It's like your way of being able to support and contribute and help other people so that I can pour more of like my finances into others to help make this world a better place. So I appreciate you all so much. I've rambled a lot this video. So thanks for like staying with me. It's the NyQuil. All right, I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.